Piers Morgan versus Jada Pinkett Smith, Part 2, Video Analysis. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor, and thank you for joining me in continuing the video analysis of the interview between Piers Morgan and Jada Pinkett Smith to enable you to understand more about the narcissistic dynamic. We're now going to continue moving along the theme of sex, which tells us more about these two narcissists as they engage in conversation. Let's dive straight back in. Wherever you go, the pair of you, you try and make love, is this I true? I mean, we've made love in some interesting places. I mean, should I be concerned about my green room? You no? should be. <laughs> you should be, you know? But the thing about it is that I feel like you have to keep spontaneity. You have to keep... Um, you have to keep your partner on their toes because once, you know, it starts getting into a routine, it's like, it gets very boring, you know, and you commit, you give your life to as someone. A, as a guy, do you look at Will Smith and you think, fantastic actor, lovely guy, blokes love him, women love him, yeah. everybody loves him, and now we've got to deal with the fact he's good in bed as well. Yeah. This is just, a, it's a charge shit. Halting the footage at one minute and 50 seconds in the original, Piers Morgan poses this point. All that I've read is that wherever you go, the pair of you, you try and make love. Is that correct? He asserts control by asking a question and by delivering flattery. He's providing proximate fuel to Jada Pinkett Smith. His question isn't a challenge because he's showing an interest in her. And therefore, as he asserts control by asking a question, he also demonstrates at the same time that he's under control because it's a benign question. Jada Pinkett Smith responds, I mean, we've made love in some interesting places. This is an oversharing of information and exhibits once again her lack of boundary recognition. This, of course, later became reinforced in the Red Table Talks, where we see repeatedly the absence of any boundary recognition whatsoever as she shares intimate details of her life with Will Smith and other factors with members of her family, without any due regard for how that makes them feel, exhibiting her absence of emotional empathy. Of course, her sense of entitlement is rampant, whereby she believes that she's entirely appropriate to mention these points and talk about herself in this manner. Her narcissism convinces her that it's all part of the growth, all part of the process of healing from a deep place, which of course is utter baloney, but it's what her narcissism does to convince her to understand that that's what she's doing, whereas what it's actually doing is shrouding her from the knowledge that what she's actually doing is asserting control and drawing fuel, gaining character traits and residual benefits. It also exhibits, of course, her hypersexuality. Somatic and elite narcissists are invariably, invariably but not always, hypersexual in their behaviour. And with her, it demonstrates that for her, this is her major method of the assertion of control over Will Smith, that she uses seduction, sex, doing the pavement, the punani pounding, engaging in making the beast with two backs, playing a game of hide the sausage. All of that is done by using sex. If you want to understand more about the way that a narcissist uses sex in order to assert control, draw fuel, and what the sexual behavior of the narcissist truly means, you really ought to read my eye-opening book, Sex and the Narcissist, which you'll find in the Knowledge Vault. With here, this is an exhibition of the hypersexuality, talking about we've made love in some interesting places. We don't need to know this. No boundary recognition, assertion of control over Morgan by providing that information. It also demonstrates, of course, that this is what has drawn and kept primarily Will Smith in place. Lashings of doing the nasty. Plenty of it being poured on top of him, having him panting like a dog. She uses sex to control, and he responds to that, and therefore her narcissism recognises that this is a very useful way of keeping him under control and drawing fuel from him. She, of course, gains a residual benefit from it by virtue of the pleasure that she experiences, but chiefly the use of this sex is there to control and draw fuel. Piers Morgan responds, So should I be worried about my green room? He tells a joke, asserts control with some flattery. 
She responds, you should be, with the confidence of, I fuck anywhere I want, because after all, I'm Jada Pinkett Smith, and I'm a shagging machine. Shows a sense of entitlement, lack of boundary recognition. Piers Morgan guffaws, showing that he's under control at this, and provides fuel as the non-intimate secondary source. Jada Pinkett Smith continues, You know, the thing about it, you need to keep spontaneity, she explains. You have to keep your partner on their toes. This is a manifestation of her need for control, seen through the narcissistic lens. If she were not a narcissist, then one would see this as emotional empathy for her partner by keeping things interesting. But remember, through an extensive observation of the evidence and a constructive consideration of the material, we've established that she's a narcissist and therefore we're always able to interpret her behaviours through that lens of narcissism. There is no other explanation for her behaviours. Everything that she does when it comes to an interaction or potential interaction with another person is governed by the pursuit of the prime aims. And here, her comment about, you know the thing about it, you need to keep spontaneity, you need to keep your partner on their toes, shows the manifestation of that need for control. She doesn't know this, but that's what's actually going on. She continues, because once it starts getting into a routine, and she pulls a face showing her disdain for this, it's like it gets very boring, and you give your life to someone. Again, this demonstrates just how significant sex is as her modus operandi for the assertion of control and the drawing of fuel. Piers Morgan then interrupts her, lack of boundary recognition. As a guy, you look at Will Smith and think, fantastic actor, lovely guy, blokes love him, women love him, everybody loves him, and now we have to deal with the fact that he's good in bed as well. This is a benign triangulation by Morgan. He's indirectly asserting control over Will Smith by talking about him in such flattering terms. Hell, it even sounds like Piers perhaps wants to get jiggy with it with Mr. Smith. And it's a benign triangulation with Will Smith over his wife to say, aren't you the lucky one that Mr. Studmuffin climbs into your bed? But notice the response of Jada Pinkett Smith to this. Yeah. Hardly ringing endorsement. Why? Because although Piers Morgan is complimenting her because Will Smith is her husband, she doesn't actually like the fact that he's talking about Will Smith. And this is actually a challenge to her because it's not about her. Hence her muted response. She doesn't say, yes, I'm a very lucky girl, or he's absolutely wonderful, or yeah, I walk like I've been riding a horse for three days after he's given it to me. None of that. A simple, yeah. Because at that juncture, her narcissism can't bring her to respond in flattering tones about Will Smith. And, to the uninitiated, you just think she was agreeing. But with my added insight, you know that that response is because her narcissism hasn't managed to bridge the gap to completely mask her disdain, dislike, for the challenge posed by Piers Morgan talking about her husband and not her. Piers Morgan then states, it's a charge sheet. You being really critical, come on, really critical, given he's sneaking in the room right now. <laughs> Let's try and dwell on a fault, one fault. He's a workaholic. Is that a fault? It can be at times, but it's not like a crushing fault. Mm. But you said one thing. I gave you one. <laughs> Halting at two minutes and 13 seconds, what do we learn from this next segment? Well, Piers Morgan continues by stating, if you were being really critical, let's dwell on a fault, one fault. Here, he's asserting control by provocation. He's asserting control over Will Smith, who apparently seemed to be sneaking back into the interview and therefore puts himself up on Piers Morgan's radar. And therefore he asserts control by, in a sense, saying, we've given him some compliments, but now let's find fault with him. And therefore, with the expectancy that she will agree with him that he has a flaw, that he has a fault, that will enable Piers Morgan to get that control. She's al he's also asserting control over Jada Pinkett Smith by asking her a question directly. So there's an indirect assertion of control over Will Smith and a direct assertion of control over Jada Pinkett Smith. Jada Pinkett Smith says he's a workaholic. That 
isn't the worst flaw perhaps that one could imagine. And the reason that she's come up with that answer isn't because she's defending him because she has emotional empathy for him. She's doing so by virtue of the facade management to make her look like she's a loyal wife. Her narcissism has selected that as the response. Piers Morgan probes further and asks, is that a fault? This is challenge fuel because he's basically querying the validity of her response. She doesn't go mental at this point, reaching over and gouging out Piers Morgan's eyes. Instead, with the facade remaining intact because it's able to deal with this minor threat to control, she states, it can be at times, but it's not like a crushing fault. But you said one thing, I gave you one. She nullifies the threat to control in a benign way by basically going down the route of pedantry by saying, you asked for one thing and I've given you one thing. And there it is. She is defending Will Smith because at this juncture, he is painted white and she nullifies the threat to control posed by Piers Morgan. Morgan laughs as her answer does at least give him control because she's answered him and given him something. And his response of laughing, of course, signals control to her. The two narcissists, even though there was a slight moment of challenge there, continue to be able to provide one another with what is required, fuel and control. To the uninformed, you might think that she's being loyal towards her husband. But this is facade management, and a narcissist will demonstrate apparent loyalty where, one, the subject of the loyalty is painted white, I gained the impression that Will Smith had been interviewed before her and no doubt said some very complimentary things about Jada Pinkett Smith, meaning he's painted white. Therefore, he's viewed as an asset. He's there to be protected. He's there to be idealised. And therefore, because of his complimentary behaviour towards her, demonstrating that he's under control, she can respond in kind. Secondly, it's done to assert control over the third party by way of triangulation. Basically, I'm defending my man in order to assert control over you, Piers Morgan. And, of course, it also allows the presentation of the facade to the watching audience who all think, ah, yes, Tammy Wynette should start playing Stand By Your Man. She's loyal, she's decent, she's looking after Will. As we know, of course, that behaviour isn't repeatedly exhibited because we've seen in other instances her complete failure to do so. We have seen the way that she has repeatedly devalued him. But in this instance, she doesn't do so because her narcissism determines that it isn't required to do that in order to achieve the prime aims. More fascinating insights into the behaviour of Jada Pinkett Smith and, of course, Piers Morgan. Join me in part three as we learn even more about the interaction between two narcissists. <laughs>